This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. We are here in this COVID era of podcasts in the uh, Craft Beer and Brewing office for a live but socially distant podcast. Sitting across the table, six feet away from me, maybe a little bit more, is uh, Melvin Brewing uh, founder, Jeremy Tofty. Welcome to the podcast, Jeremy. Hello, America. Um, this is actually the second Craft Beer and Brewing podcast that I've recorded with Jeremy. And uh, you might be asking, well, you know, Jamie, we never heard the first podcast that you did with Jeremy Tofty. And, uh, and that's because it has never aired to this date. Uh, it was actually the very first podcast that I ever recorded. Uh, GABF a few years, uh, 2017, I guess. And um, Yeah, so- I noticed you have all new equipment here. It's looking good. <laughs> that was a one heck of a day. I tell you what, we had a big nonprofit party uh, called the House of Flying Barrels. Yeah. And we had Hacksaw Jim Duggan come and shoot a video with us you did you guys were so like fun. you know doing commercial out in the back alley with you know the you know with i don't know you against world bev or yeah, whatever world it was. Bev. yeah yeah uh anyway we're gonna do a redo now and and you know the upside of that is that uh, the audience for the podcast is uh probably 20 times what it was for that very first episode obviously melvin uh you know has, has made uh the news over the last few years some good ways some bad um we're going to kind of hash through uh, some of the ups and downs uh you know it's been a, a rough couple of years on the business side it's been a rather amazing you know couple of years from the beer side we're going to kind of delve into some of those challenges and some of the things that jeremy's learned through that process some of the the um you know the learning moments from some of those harder points. We're also going to uh, delve into some of the magic that makes those hoppy beers that Melvin is known for um, so magical. And uh, I'm going to do my Oprah best to squeeze the deep, dark secrets out of uh, you know Jeremy's brewing mind. Before we do that, nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. Innovative modular designs and no proprietary parts propel G&D ahead as the premier choice for your glycol chilling needs. Breweries you recognize, Russian River and Cotton, Posse, Jack's Abbey, Samuel Adams, and more trust GD to chill the beer you love. Call GD Chillers to discuss your project today or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, Old Orchard invites you to step up your fruit game with their premium craft juice blends. Whether you're planning a passion fruit Kolsch, Concord Sour, Mango Lager, or other fruity brew, Old Orchard can supply you with consistent product at affordable prices. Their blends are packed with real fruit and natural flavors with no added sugar or other weird fillers you'd find in knockoff brands. With the rising demand for fruity seltzers and brews, the time is ripe to grow your relationship with the right juice supplier. Get your Old Orchard sample kit today with free six-pack cooler at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer. So Jeremy... Uh, we've been friends for a number of years. Uh, you came out to our brewer's retreat a number of years ago up in the Astoria Coast. I've uh, popped up and camped out on the Melvin property for Madness Days. Uh, I don't know, that was probably three or four years ago. Um, and man, my kids got, uh, they were a mess after that weekend of camping. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, your brewing history and how what your experience in the, in the brewing industry looked like. Yeah, okay, I started... Um, in the craft beer industry, I guess I was born into it. Um, my dad had a distributorship up in Northwest Washington and craft beer just kind of, it was called micro brews back then. And it was, uh, Burt Grant's Deschutes, Widmere, Red Hook. And I started drinking that beer at a young age. I guess my, the beer that really uh, made it work for me was Black Hook. I drank that and then Sheaf Stout out of Australia hmm. and Chimay. Cause those were all in the way back of the warehouse. Cause I started working for my dad when I was yeah, 12, yeah. when I was 12, the dusty bottles that yep. uh, no one inventoried. Mm-hmm. And so then I started working in breakage and repairing six packs and turning them into 12 packs and, you know, cleaning bottles so we could make a new six pack. And I would just be so excited when someone would break a Deschutes case because craft beer wasn't really hitting back then. So you could never break two cases of Deschutes in one month. So you can never refill that 
that case. And so we just, me and my sister would just drink that beer. <laughs> and so yeah, really, yeah. you know, right away started saying to myself, like, what is this? Like, this is so different than. We do you know, not condone this kind yeah. of behavior. Do not uh, Don't, try this at home. No underage. But yeah, my dad worked for Ham's Brewing, Miller Brewing. He worked in uh, Minnesota and then Milwaukee. And then they moved him out to the West Coast. And, you know, I have a picture of my sister drinking Miller Lite when she's about 16 months old. And it's just beer has been in our family. My grandpa worked for Al Capone up in North Dakota, running one of his legal businesses that has a tunnel from the basement to Canada where they brought the whiskey in. So it just runs in our family for better or worse. Sorry, mom. <laughs> and uh, So how, how in particular did you uh, come out of this kind of family background and say, hey, I'm going to start a craft brewery and mm-hmm. then... Uh, on the flip side of that, this is what it's going to be about. And we're going to kind of change the way that this kind of style is made. I was delivering beer when I was 16 and I walked into uh, Will Kemper's brewery called Thomas Kemper and something, the smell, the feel, everything just struck me. I was 16 years old and I looked around and I told myself, I, I'm going to be in the beer industry. This is what I want to do. And I, of course, my dad was prepping me and my sister both to help him run the company, uh, which him and my mom ran for 30 years. And we didn't go that direction at all. We wanted something smaller, and I wanted to work less because he works so much, not realizing now I just work all the time, and he makes fun of me for that. But I walked into you know, Thomas Kemper, said, this is what I want to do. And when I went to college in Bend, Oregon, uh, John Harris was making some of the best beers in the world at Deschutes at that point, And we had fake IDs, which we do not condone anymore, but we'd go into obsidian stout night, which was every Wednesday night and just drinking that obsidian stout. I knew I had to really follow my dreams and my passions started homebrewing with this gentleman named Jamie and there's no internet back then. So we just had to figure it out and you'd just ask other, the other four homebrewers, like, what do you do? And then we'd go ask the brewers at Deschutes and it just became that, that passion where as a home brewer, you know, you cannot live without home brewing. You have to brew. And next thing you know, I moved to Jackson hole snowboard every single day. And it just wasn't fulfilling to me. I had to do something. So I knew Portland, Oregon had the most breweries per capita in America at that point in the nineties. So I moved to Portland, Oregon, applied at all 33 breweries, got a job at Norwester. And Norwester at that point, I think was 40,000 barrels in year two or three. It was absolutely insane. Yeah. I got a brew on the pilot system there, Phil kegs. And I met Michael Jordan, which is pretty cool. He's a, he's a brewer. He's now at boxing cat brewing in uh, China. So he, he was one of the guys that just like really helped me along and helped me understand uh, what I didn't know from home brewing to pro brewing. But I never made it up to actual brewing at Norwester. It was just just didn't work out for me there. So I ended up going to college and moved back to Jackson where I started a Thai restaurant. And that was my platform to put a little more beer 20 gallon brew system right. in, in the back of my 180 square foot prep room and start making uh, West Coast IPAs because we couldn't find IPAs in Wyoming at that point. And so, uh, yeah, you started doing this and it became a bit of a kind of cult favorite in Jackson. And then beer people started talking about it. And, you know, your partner at that point, uh, you brought a a brewer in who, um, you know, had made a name for himself also. Um, And you started changing the game around that kind of, you know, West Coast IPA approach. Uh, Won some medals, won, you know, Alpha King Challenge and kind of made a splash at this small little, you know, tiny back of the restaurant brewery. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you then decided to go from small brew pub approach to large scale production brewery with distribution in a multi-state footprint. Well, there's a secret that we learned a long time before some of the other breweries. I'm going to tell you all that little secret right now. You can use it if you choose to. It's called Whirlpool Hops. So... <laughs> <laughs> Back then, it just, I don't know, it just people I've heard whispers about yeah, that. Yeah, people weren't doing it. We, yeah. we contract brewed at a friend's brewery in Idaho and on their 30 barrel system because we only had a three barrel. And the other brewers were like, You're wasting all those hops. Why are you putting in the hops at the end? That's a total waste. Like, and you can't put rice flakes in. That's what Budweiser does. And that was for two by four. And 
that's all we did. We we just late edition hopped and whirlpooled and brought temperature down to in the one nineties because yeah. uh, we boil at 200, 202 degrees in Wyoming. Yeah. So bring it down to the low nineties and add all of our whirlpool hops, and that's kind of the secret. And as we've <laughs> gone into a bigger brewery, we now have a two thirty dual thirty barrel systems. And we have always decided that we are going to keep the same exact recipes from timing up over to the, to the Melvin system. It's just something we're not going to start dumbing down the recipes and I guess cheapen them. It's got to be that superior quality. It's got to be the excellent, excellent beer that we've always made. But as we're growing up, we're understanding there's this thing called like hop circulation and recirc. And so we're taking a pump through the uh fermenters and turns out we can pass sensory with 20 percent less hops and we just just by being a little more efficient in your driving process and we just figured that out this year and so we don't even want to take a calculator out and figure out how much hops we've kind of just thrown away (laughs) but yeah the the state of alpine or the state of wyoming has been very good to us and the state of uh, this town of alpine is where our brewery is 828 people they've been very good to us and they gave us uh three million dollars of taxpayer money to help buy the land and start the brewery and Mm -hmm. we paid for all the equipment but the state paid for the building and alpine's about what 40 minutes down the road from jackson 30 Mm -hmm. somewhere around there yep about 45 minute drive from jackson hole where my restaurant is and it is beautiful snake river canyon it is beautiful wow yeah I uh, put up some gorgeous Instagram photos of sunsets over the reservoir from that property. Uh, it is a weird place to put a production brewery. It's yeah. not necessarily in a you know, transportation hub and getting uh, ingredients there. Although I guess you know you're getting ingredients coming from the Pacific Northwest. It's not that far to uh, to get your hops. Uh, yeah, and we have uh, our grain comes from two and a half hours away. Yeah, so it's really hop skip and a jump. Yeah. Um, let's talk, you, you know, you started talking about some brewing technique there and I appreciate that because that's what we love to talk most about here on the podcast. As you envisioned that very first Melvin IPA and then what would become two by four, this kind of classic, uh, double IPA with this new school West coast approach, obviously using late hopping techniques, obviously using, you know, heavy dry hop addition. Um, talk to me about some, uh, uh, you know, the way that you all, works through that kind of creative process. I'm, I'm always fascinated by brewers who envision things that don't exist. And, you know, whether it's Pliny the Elder and Russian River and thinking about how do we make a, a double IPA when no one made double IPAs, um, and then thinking about a dry hop process that's going to help bring that that character, you know, out of that kind of beer. Or, you know, even someone thinking about pastry stouts in a way that no one made paste like you know there are all of these moments where brewers set on to something um and i'm curious about where that vision piece lies you know how is it that you know how, how did you say to yourselves hey this could be different was that inspiration driven by the ingredients that you were you know working with and that you thought could convey in a different way um was it based on you know other kinds of food and beverage experience and flavors and where you know you worked backwards and said hey this is that flavor and i think we could try to recreate this or, or capture this kind of thing what does that creative process what did what did that creative process look like and how does that look now in the melvin kind of process it all started with it had to go well with Thai food because we are a Thai restaurant. And at that point, we only thought, you know, within our, our building, we were never going to be more than just a three barrel system or first a 20 gallon system and then a three barrel system in that 3000 square foot restaurant. And I think the best way to sum that up is one of our brewers, Sam, was brewing on the timing up system last week. He was brewing cherry bomb and he went through all the old recipes from since 2012. And he came to me, he's like, there's like 10 different recipes. And that's true with every single beer. You look at the two by four, we first brewed it maybe in 2010 on the 20 gallon. And then three barrel, you see every single time we brewed it, we changed it. We always did something different. And that's, what we're doing now in the seven barrel system that we have at the Alpine facility, Ian and Patrick and Craig and the crew are just always doing something different. Just like I think all brewers 
uh, do. We just keep on trying something new. You make it, you put it on tap and Sarah runs our lab. She has uh, we have an app, a sensory app where everyone goes through every single beer that we release to make sure it's either to style or if it's a new beer, like what is that beer? Let's, let's make sure that that beer is, is known and we give it a name, log it. And then we go back and look at that beer again and say, okay, how can we make this different? How can we make this more what we want it to be? And I think that's a lot of what the brewers are doing right now, uh, nationwide and worldwide, but I know we're doing it for sure. Just always trying to figure out how to make it smoother, how to make it better. Like a lot of our beers that we come out with, you know, we're, we have this beer called me, myself and Ty, which we did as a collaboration with time. Yep which is kind of cool. And it's the first time we've ever done something like that together officially. I've got a can of it right here sitting on the table. Nice. Thank you. You're going to like it. I I have liked it. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. And yeah, it's that. Readers of the magazine can uh, find the review in the uh, upcoming IPA issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, but that's a shameless plug. Right on, right on. And there's another shameless plug. That beer, Me, Myself, and Ty, is becoming our year-round core beer, called back into haze August 1st because we liked it so much. Um, Ian Fuller is our new head brewer and he came from Elysian. So he was their experimental brewer. He just knows so much about beer. He's so experienced, but yet he's culturally such a great fit. He worked in Nkasi for years with Jamie, just side by side for years from, you know, small brewery to huge brewery was head brewer at Payette in Idaho. Those guys are sure. awesome. And so coming over to our spot, you know, we have that seven barrel system, we have the three barrel and then we have a 10 barrel in St. Louis. It's like, do whatever you want, just do it. And I think having that creative freedom where he can, you know, direct the team to experiment on the seven barrel, but also keep on crushing out the core beers that are our staple and our bread and butter that just seem to keep on getting better and more clean and better shelf life. And yeah, I think that's uh, that about sums that up. As you're thinking about a beer like Two by Four, though, back in the day, um, what did that iteration process look like? Obviously, yes, you change, you you continue to develop um, the recipe with each batch, and since you're brewing on a, you know a tiny, tiny system, you're brewing a whole lot of times, and and so that gives you a whole lot of opportunities to make small tweaks and try different mm-hmm. things. Um, is there a range to that kind of experimentation, or where did you find yourself spending the most kind of time? You know, on which variables, uh, you know, did you focus the most on dialing in? Grain always stayed the same. Yeah. So grain was always the same. It was more late edition hops and dry hopping always changed. I think dry hopping was four pounds per barrel, which is great on a three barrel system because we're selling it all over the bar. Sure. You know, we're giving the customers something that they really enjoy and we're getting a paid what it's worth. But trying to do that on a 60 barrel system isn't very realistic, but we've we've been doing it for five years. (laughs) And, uh, well, the hops growers of the Pacific Northwest. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for your patronage. You really do. (laughs) And it's, it's the hops that always changed. The, the tweaks, we've always had the small tweaks where you, if you look through the recipe book, which we should probably just publish online, it's just little tweaks of a pound here, a few ounces there. Like, cause we, the way we do it is we do it AA units and we use that system mathematically to figure out how much hops we're going to put in. I'm, I'm sure everyone does that, but we don't just be like, Oh, 3.4 pounds. We're like, we do a mathematical equation to all of our beers that give us kind of we think we know what we're going to get but it's always the hops and they're so fun and now there's so many hops it's almost like like all you brewers out there it's like you know how it is you you hear it from one of your friends because you get a call from a buddy that just had some experimental version from some small farm that you can't get and it's like oh my god it tastes like coconut and it's just such a great time to be alive in this industry because there is so much happening so fast and it's, I think it's good for, good for everybody. As you scaled those recipes up to this kind of production brewing scale, um, what changed? I mean, you met, you are trying to keep it the same, but inevitably, you know, nothing scales one-to-one mm-hmm. on that. And what matters is that it tastes ultimately the way that you take, you know, that you remember it or that it should be, or that people feel, you know, as they're going through sensory is true to the brand. Um, 
what uh, you know, what was that learning process moving from tiny little three barrel system to a 30 barrel production brew house? Well, lucky for us, I was able to uh, meet Dave Tichura, formerly of Oscar Blues, after we won the couple gold medals for IPA and double IPA at Great American Beer Festival. Not even knowing what that meant or what that was, we were just kind of there, and all of a sudden we hear our name. We're like, "What? What's going on here?" And I think it was the first time it was like in. That's in a, a nice story, but you had to pay for entries, ship them to them, and uh, there was clearly some sort of conscious intent on that. One, yeah, Jimmy. but you just didn't expect. You know, you never expected. All you guys sure. out there that have women that have won, it's like you don't expect that at all. You hope for it, and after we won, you know, it was a lot smaller back then. Yeah, because we're kind of we're kind of you know older these days and. Back then, it was it was our first Great American Beer Festival, and we got a silver for Cherry Bomb, gold for our Melbourne IPA, gold for Double IPA, and Alpha King. Just blew our minds. And afterwards, walked out of the auditorium, and there's all my heroes, right? Like Vinny's up there, and Natalie, they just come up and shake my hand, and I'm like, oh my god, they just shook my hand. Do you guys see that? And then Chichura came up, gives me his business card. He's like, call me anytime. And I was like, no way. And so, of course, when you, I had a beer bar at that point, tie me up, where I was just, I think I was the number one account for New Belgium, number one account for Odell's, or maybe number two in the state. Oh, well, it's Wyoming. So back then. So you're making some of your beer, but you're also selling beer yeah, yeah. F- for these other Totally, because sure. we, we want to have the best beer possible, because on tap next to ours, just to let everyone know, like, hey, you know, we might be in the back of a Thai restaurant, but check our beers out to other people's, and you'll see that they're comparable, and you might like one better than the other, but yeah. they're all good, hopefully. And so Chichura... Gave me his card, which he shouldn't have. And I just, <laughs> so I started texting him like, Hey man, I saw you guys got some of that new beer. Can I get some? And he always be like, who is this? <laughs> and every time I'd be like, Jeremy. And so finally we're like looking for a, a head brewer and I just knew it had to be him. And cause he just, you know, he, he has that, that science behind him and that the ability to grow a brand from, he took Oscar blues from 5,000 to a hundred thousand with the help of his whole team and texted him, hey, you got the stuff? Because I was trying to do a funny, like, uh, Cheech and Chong reference, because his name's Dave. And, of course, he's like, what do you want? <laughs> or, like, why are you texting me? I probably still have it. <laughs> and I was like, I'd like you to work for Melvin. And he's like, what's Melvin? Because I think at that point, people knew us. It's like, tie me up. I have no idea. So, yeah, we got him on the team, and he was able to take – our three barrel recipes and scale them up. And the big thing back to your question, what changed the mash temperatures. Huh? So I remember on two by four and I think we've kind of refined everything since, but uh, mash temp on two by four was 149 on the three barrel, 156 on the third barrel. Interesting. Huge swing. Yeah. But yet that's what made it taste exactly like it did on the three barrel. We'll give one to uh Chura for uh for working that out. Let's talk a little bit more about that. But first, this episode is brought to you by Hopsteiner, your premium hop supplier dedicated to delivering quality hops and hops products in every package. Visit hopsteiner.com for a complete list of offerings or select shop hops to start ordering today. Also, Ska Fabricating is excited to introduce the newest player in their all-star lineup of canning line automation, the Magic Bus, a fully automatic candy palletizer with pallet management. No more pouring time and labor into the manual handling of pallets, top frames, and tear sheets on your canning line. Packaging teams can simply load cans, deband, and press start. To learn more, contact Scafab today at 970-403-8562 or reach out online at scafabricating.com. And i just like to say we work with both of those companies. They both get an A+. Plus. Fantastic. Fantastic. You, you heard it right here. The process of... Uh, development and of innovation for Melvin is something that you guys just haven't slept on even as the production brewery has gotten up to full speed. Um, you know, you, you built a rotational, uh, you know, double IPA special strategy a few years back where things kind of come in for seasons and then go depending on the market. Um, you, you know, beers like Citradamus and you can tell me all the rest. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, that, that has been a strategy that you employ. Obviously you just mentioned the, you know, uh, me, myself and Ty collaboration is going to become a new, uh, you know, full-time hazy beer. I think, uh, cloudy 5,000 
last year, uh, you know, blew up with, uh, with our reviewers here, craft beer and brewing magazine. Um, you know, you've kind of continued to hop, you know, well, that's a terrible pun, <laughs> but you've continued to jump on, uh, you know, and not just jump on, but, um, actively engage in some of these trends as they develop in the brewing world. And, um, put your own Melvin spin on it. Talk to me a little bit about that innovation process and how that looks and uh, some of the things you all have learned through that process of uh, testing and trying you know, new techniques with hops, uh, ways that hops interact with yeast, ways that those hops interact with different malt bills on the hazy and cloudy side of, uh, of brewing, et cetera. Yeah, a lot of that goes towards the sales team. We have about 10 salespeople working with the brewing team. And a big part of that is Travis Cook, our creative director. He seems to have his finger on the pulse of pretty much everything in the world. So Travis is creative director now. Yeah. So I've known Travis for a whole lot of years mm-hmm. before he worked for Melvin. That's fantastic. Yeah. Creative director. Mm-hmm. What's the creative director for a brewery do? Comes up with ideas, works with the team to implement those ideas. And Danielle and him are the one-two punch, I guess, that really figures out ways to keep our brand relevant and new moving in the right direction, finding new customers. But yet at the same time, we're, you know, we're a service industry at the end of the day, pleasing our old customers. Um, we know that when people see the Melbourne name, they trust it. Like our true fans know that if it has the Melbourne name on it, if they buy it, they will not be disappointed. It'll be a good beer. And I think, just having all the team seeing what's happening in the market. And as we all know, us brewers, like we kind of work off of each other to be like, what's happening now? What are you doing? How do we do it? And Travis, you know, he came up with the Ripa series, rotational India Imperial IPAs. He actually has a rap about it on YouTube <laughs> called crack the Ripa, crack, crack the Ripa. It's a slow sipper. And, you know, just working with the team to, to say, okay, what, how do we do this? Like, what do we do? Like the Lambda, 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 13% triple IPA, yeast killer. Brewers aren't totally stoked every time we have to make it. So yeah. now we just release that a couple, you know, once every couple of years. But always saying what's next. Like, what can we do that's going to be new? Because as a lot of you probably know, I heard that 30% of the listeners are brewers. The customer wants something new each and every single day. So you know what? Let's give it to them. It's fun for us. It's fun for them. Danielle may not be stoked to be sending, you know, registrations to TTB like half of her day, every single day, because we're coming up with so many beers, but it is something that just keeps us on our tippy toes, keeps us nimble so that we can keep adapting and keep making the great things that we're all doing. It's just beer. You know, it's at the end of the day, not easy, but it's not difficult, but coming up with like the newest beer that's coming out, boom shaka zaka (laughs) you know it's like a throwback to the old the old old days where we all played nba jams if you're of of that uh that age and he's heating up he's on fire boom shaka zaka and we used the zaka hops and it's a phenomenal beer just canned yesterday look for it in your local uh retailer but it's uh always what's next what can we do never always being satisfied with what we did because we're really proud of of what we do as a team but how can we do it better it's an interesting um question and i want to ask you about how that has looked over the last couple months you know march you know it's june now um in talking to other brewers and in looking at some of our survey data of our you know readership and uh you know email lists and whatnot we have seen a dramatic decline in that kind of experimental attitude, definitely through this whole COVID panic thing, uh, pandemic, sorry, not panic, um, you know, with shutdowns and with sampling opportunities limited and, you know, with uh, beer bars not serving things on draft, with tap rooms not able to, you know, uh, pour samplers for folks, uh, you know, it becomes harder and harder, like even though, consumers and that has been the mantra for the last several years that people always want something new uh it's been harder and harder to push something new out to people and have it connect with them and you know we even saw it in in the survey that we did that's published in our new issue of the brewing industry guide where you know 
we saw like, you know, 23, 25 point drop in consumers that rate their own appetite for experimentation. For you all, have you seen some of that where the newer, smaller brands and specialty things have, um, you know, maybe not uh, taken off as much or that you've seen a interesting boost in some of the kind of core things that people know they like? Yeah, for sure. We used a lot of data and we moved to 16 ounce cans on our specialty. That makes a big difference at the store. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, 16 ounce. We only have that in independent groceries, no chains. So it's something that's special just for our friends at the independents that got us to where we are because chains are new to us. So lucky for us, we didn't start releasing, I mean, releasing a couple beers a month now, it seems like we weren't doing that for the last couple of years. We were focusing on our core and making our core just good as it can be. And now when people see us coming out with something new, like I said, our, our true fans, they see it and they're going to try it. And we learned a trick at Tie Me Up and we had a three barrel system called everybody wants something they can't have. So business tip, craft brewing 101, just don't make too much of it. Just make enough so the right people get it. And when we come out with it again, maybe in a year or so. Uh, the people that didn't get to try it and have heard about it. And if they respect the person that they heard talk about the beer, they're going to try it and they're going to look for it. They're going to put it on their, their, their tap list or their tick list, I guess. And we've been really lucky to just make enough as we've been growing up as a brewery. We didn't realize this was a business and this is, you know, a competition and some of the bigger breweries, they're out for blood. We didn't get that. We were kind of like a puppy. We're like, this is fun. And now we understand like, yeah, this we're competing with some really big breweries that have a lot of money and rightly so they should because they cr created a path for breweries like us to follow. And so we went ahead and hired uh, another Elysian alumni. So we've got three managers from Elysian now because obviously an Elysian knew what they were doing and they still do. So their national sales manager, Brian Giddens, also known as Mr. Wiggles, is now our national sales manager and he's given us so much structure but at the same time he's letting us know how to release a beer and you know we used to just be like hey distributors uh we got some new beer you want it and now months ahead of time we're letting the distributors know we have the beer distributors are letting the stores our sales reps are letting the stores know the brewers are trying experimental batches the entire time and once we get something totally nailed it goes to the big system and so we've gotten really lucky having someone like Brian on board to direct our sales team and work with Ian, who's also from the brewery they worked at together. Their communication is so good. They are able to just flow seamlessly between beers. And I really appreciate that, guys, if you're listening. Thank you. And for us, it's, it's been really, really good. Sounds like a bi-directional system where you know the sales team is listening to the market and listening to what the retailers you know, who have that information on what their customers want to buy or are conveying that to you. And you can take that and then put a Melvin spin or create the Melvin beers that feel like Melvin beers that, uh, that those customers are going to want to buy from you. Yeah. And we have this, uh, wonderful man named Jay Z lives in Spokane, Washington, and he is our key accounts manager. And thanks to this company called Armadillo, we are able to actually get data now. And we can see, like, for instance, we pitched, we have this cool beer that we love called Pilsner. It's a hoppy Pilsner. And we've been brewing it for quite a while. We love it. We pitched it to the Kroger chain for Southern California, being like, oh my gosh, it's Southern California. This beer would taste so good down there. And Armadillo took us through a little, um, they took us into the data. And they're like, look, Pilsners are down in Southern California, like 20%. So of course we didn't get that placement because we didn't know, like yeah. we didn't have the tools and Armadillo went ahead and they've now have a craft brewery um, package that you can. What's wrong with San Diego? Why is Pilsner down down there? I know it's so That's good. ridiculous. I know they need to step it up. They do Top need heads. to step it up. Jeez. And so now Pilsners we. Pilsners are hoppy. Come on. <laughs> now as we're growing up, we get can... with the Pilsner program, San Diego. <laughs> Only if it's a free Pilsner. <laughs> Those are good. <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you're now using data to kind of, you know, to find those kinds of, of placements mm -hmm. and whatnot. Because, yeah, before that same package was like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. There's no way a brewery our size can afford that. So we used to get, we have friends in the industry that would sneak us information, but it wasn't current. It wasn't, it yeah. didn't feel, feel good. That's some inside, uh, inside baseball uh, business information right there, which uh, is interesting. But let's turn the conversation back to brewing. Before we do that, the epi this episode is brought to you by Brewers Publications, publishers of historical brewing techniques, The Lost Art of Farmhouse Brewing by Lars Marius Garshall. Equal parts history, cultural anthropology, social science, and travelogue. Historical Brewing Techniques describes Northern European farmhouse brewing and fermentation methods that are vastly different from modern craft brewing. Order your copy of Historical Brewing Techniques today at brewerspublications.com. Also, Craft Beer and Brewing's all-access subscriptions give you a year of the print and digital editions of the magazine, plus access to our library of video courses, a special deep dive email only for all-access subscribers, premium content, and all-access exclusive merchandise. Go to Beer and Brewing com and click on the subscribe button to join now and i would just like to say if you do go to the brewers publications and check out wood and beer by dick cantwell and peter buchart you can win a signed copy wednesday june 17th on the melvin happening hour at 7 p.m on facebook well there you go go join melvin for their happening hour on facebook um both you know, Peter has been on the, the podcast uh, somewhat recently, and Dick Cantwell has uh, been one of our master brewers at a brewer's retreat uh, at, uh, up at Devil's Thumb and an uh, incredibly creative brewer and uh, brewing genius. Next level. Yeah, yeah. On to you know, some, some other place. Uh, but let's get back to talking about Melvin's approach to brewing. Um, of the beers you have been brewing recently, and I shouldn't say you brewing recently because your role is I haven't not, brewed in years. And you're, you know, Let's get not, real, people. You know, uh, having said that, uh, you have brewed quite a bit over the, the number of years. Um, of the beers that you're brewing these days, what do you find exciting in terms of trends and techniques, and where do you find um, some of Melvin's experimentation now you know, pushing into? I think a big addition to our team has been Eli and Eli worked all over Denver and all over Tahoe for a number of years. Very capable, eccentric, amazing brewer. Um, him and his fiance Katie are both running the brewing portion of our St. Louis, which is actually Eureka. It's the town of Eureka, Missouri brew pub. And he thinks of beer almost in a culinary way. Um, he's a master at pastry stouts, sours, double IPAs, IPAs. He was a big, big force behind the Cloudy 5000, which I believe scored like a 98 on your um, blind tasting. I believe it did. And, you know, that was his knowledge bringing it to us and, and showing us what was possible because we were still doing stuff. Even at Tie Me Up, you know, we were playing with the water, but we just, we liked that bitterness. So we'd make a hazy beer with a little bit of bitterness and we loved it. it sells like crazy at time me up. But if you put that on tap in Brooklyn, people would be like, what is this? Two caps. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Eli, I think Eli was a really big part, uh, working with our brew team. Um, he graced us, him and Katie both came to Alpine, Wyoming and worked with us. I believe it was last winter or two winters ago. Jeez. Time flies. And, jumped on the pilot system and gave us, um, you know, he says terms. I still don't know like what they are. I have to like look them up. All right. Actually, I just ask him. He's like so free with his knowledge. It's amazing. He's, if you ever want to know some stuff about beer, call Eli because he is so free with his information and really wants you to understand it. And he's, he's, I feel he's taken us to a great space in the, uh, in the Hayes game. And now that we were making a great haze base beers, all the brewers are at first, you know, it's kind of like, eh, do we want to make this? Right. And now it's like, we're coming out with new ones all the time because they're so good and they're so fun. And they're so fun to play around with. And of course, Ian being an experimental brewer, he's just, now he's taken it to the next level. It's great. So yeah, just the, the teamwork makes the dream work. It's an interesting thing thinking about, um, brewing for a national palate rather than a regional one. Um, 
talk to me a little bit about that kind of approach to beer design, because I think that, I mean, that's a really interesting point in terms of consumer expectation versus point of view of the brewery. You know, Mm -hmm. all of these things happen in in some sort of tension and balance. And, you know, you want to make a beer that feels like Melvin, but at the same time, you also want people to enjoy the beer. And if people come at this thing and it doesn't meet them where they expect it to be based on their own, you know, the, the biases that they bring, you know, to that kind of tasting, um, then they're not going to enjoy what you make. How, how does that process look for you all to, to kind of incorporate that overall, like this is what those expectations look like for people. And we want to make a beer that meets those expectations, pushes them in a Melvin kind of Melvin direction, but within a certain kind of parameter. Yeah. We have a marketing call every Monday and a sales call an hour before that. And then every other Monday after both of those calls, we have the brewers production and the sales marketing call. All brewers, all salespeople are invited to that call to just go over what's happening outside of Wyoming. Um, and there's the dialogue that's created there goes on to form what's going to happen in our like 2020 and 2021 strategies where, you know, we're coming out with a sour soul series, kettle sours and coming out with all kinds of haze coming out with a sip of series. Uh, the brewers want to make how like a hell is and a steam beer. So 2021, we have every trimester, a uh, SIPA, which is just a light drinking. Just take a sip of it. Probably all under 5%. Just something that the brewers want to make that they can really show off their technical skills. Because, you know, the kind of joke in in brewing is, you know, just throw a lot of hops in and you can hide all your imperfections. And that's uh, that's something that the brewers want to do is just show everyone their lager skills and their their real cool technical skills. I don't know. I think that, you know, while there are those old saws, you know, within brewing that if you just put a lot of hops in it, then people won't notice, you know, these days you can't get away with that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Like it just doesn't work. You know, the, even the brewers themselves and your peers, they can still taste where you're, you're phoning it in and your consumers are more savvy than they've ever been about, um, the quality of expression of these kinds of things, you know? Um, and I think I've talked about it a little bit before, but you know, the, as, we march along in history. Um, the ability to produce quality beer for professional brewers increases significantly year over year. The technology, the knowledge, that kind of base allows the average quality of beer to increase significantly. And if you look at the average quality of craft beer right now in 2020 compared to where it was in 95 when I started drinking craft beer or in, in you know 2000 or 2005 or 2010, any of these kind of you know five years along, the quality, average quality of craft beer that's made today in America or worldwide is so much better than it's ever been at any other point in the history. Hundred percent. I haven't had a bad beer in a couple of years. It, it's been it's really incredible, and I don't know that we tell this story often enough. Enough, but you know, if you look at right, our our definition of off beer is would be a fantastic beer in 1998 terms. <laughs> you know, like. Um, the 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 average quality of this beer is so much higher and so you know but at the same time the other thing that marches along in tandem with that is consumers ability to differentiate between smaller and you know more and more finite differences in quality between those things and so you know as we as this average quality is just continued this endless march higher and higher Consumers are better and better at teasing out the small differences between what makes a high quality beer, an average quality beer, and a low quality beer. And so, you know, from that kind of, you know, perspective, like the consumers are still paying attention to it. Brewers are still paying attention to it. There still are these strata between top level producers, mid level producers, average producers, et cetera. Um, yeah. How do you, from a 
business perspective from a, a brewer that has always been kind of pushing that edge of high quality production, make sure that you stay there that you don't, you know, find things dropping off, like, you know, maintaining that position right there of this top level of respect among beer drinkers, because what you're producing is still up there on that creative edge. Um, that's a hard place to stay from a business standpoint. How do you stay there? I think the biggest investment we made right away is, you know, we got a lot of state money. Thank you, Wyoming. And we got a lot of investors. So I think we have 22 investors uh, in Melbourne, in Wyoming. And in the business plan, you know, we put a couple hundred thousand dollars in there for a lab. All right, I think we put 150 and we put another 50 in since because we knew sooner or later our beer was going to end up on the store shelves of major chains. It's just the natural progression of a regional brewery. You know, we're in a town of 800 people, so we knew we weren't going to sell all the beer locally, although Shannon, our lab man, our taproom manager, does an amazing job making that happen. So Sarah and Patrick run our lab, and they will not let any beer out of there, period. That does not meet our standards, and we've never, we've yet to dump a beer. Like, we've had low fills and stuff every now and again, but that's just some kind of glitch in the filling system. But they, they will not let a bad beer out of there. So in our lab, Sarah and Patrick are highly disciplined to make sure that our beer is always top quality. They're so proud. And the whole team, they, they just, they love beer and they love our beer because we're doing it together. It's, it's an amazing feeling. And I think any brewery that wants to start should invest in some kind of lab. I know we've always opened our lab up to any brewery in Wyoming. I know Widmere opens their lab to Oregon brewers. So if you want to know what your beer is actually made of, there are companies out there you can send it out to for on the cheap. It's like sure. 30, 35 bucks a sample or something to, there's a company in Oregon that does it as well. And just knowing once we have that spec, we got to stay in that spec because if you get out of it, um, it's not going to work. And then, you know, there's other things we've learned over time because uh, we brought on Peter Buchart to, he was a board member at Melvin and he's a technical advisor for us. He's a crazy Belgian. <laughs> Bukhart, uh, <laughs> the former brewmaster of New Belgium and now owner of uh, Purpose Brewing here in Fort Collins. Sure. Purpose Brewing, good stuff. And, and a former guest here on the podcast. Okay, okay. I bet his episode got like 18 views. You're, you're actually really close. 18,000? 18,000. 18,800. <laughs> 18, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So could you understand a word he said? <laughs> it doesn't matter. So I learned with Peter, when he laughs, you laugh. That's all you need to do. No, but he's... He brought so much professionalism and insight to our team because when you're, you know, see things out of your eyes, you see it the way you see it. Bringing in a third party uh, has, in any situation in your life, has been a great eye-opening experience to to change things and make things better and more streamlined. What he likes to say is he has a saying called "stupid little tricks," and it started with dry hopping. He's like, why do you put four pounds per barrel in the two by four? I'm like, I don't know. It's just cause what we do. So we did it. Tie me up. He's like stupid old habit. That's what he calls it. Stupid old habit. And so now every time he says stupid old habit, we review that and be like, why are we doing that? And nine out of, well, hundred percent of the time he's right. It's like, we're just doing it. Cause that's what we've always done. doesn't mean it's the right way to do something. Um, what other kinds of innovative, um, processes have you all discovered over the last few years that have helped you maintain or improve the quality of the beer that you're making, but while also doing it in a more efficient or cost effective way. And, and, you know, that's not to say that you're making it cheaper, though mm -hmm. all of the money that you save is something you can put into other parts of the brewery to improve quality somewhere else. Um, you know, by not wasting things in one place, those are resources that you apply to overall kind of quality approach. Um, are there any specific things that, that you figured out um, through that kind of process of, of uh, you know, using a lab, figuring this out and, and testing the kind of impact of these things? Uh, any kind of behaviors that you've then forced yourselves to unlearn or some techniques or processes that you've been able to replace and uh, with more efficient ones? 
Yeah, for sure. We circulate hops now through our fermenters. Yeah. You know, for years we just dropped them in the top man way and called it good. And we'd purge them with CO2 from the bottom, but from the racking arm and whatnot. But now we circulate and with an external pump. mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And that's, that's helping immensely. Like we're reducing our hops 20%, but it passes sensory. And so it tastes like the exact same beer. Another cool thing we did was, and there's no oxygen pickup or, mm -hmm. you know, negative, uh, it's like a positive displacement pump. And I don't totally understand how this work, Yeah, but I know that keeps it super cool. Okay. And another super thing that Peter recommended, like easy stuff. This is the third eye. Like if you want someone to come into your brewery and if you have open eyes, open heart and an open head and you don't, you let someone, you know, help you. Well, that's what we did with him. And he just gave us recommendations and always does some we can do some we can't, but one was a uh, putting a heat exchanger. We're not hard piped yet. So, well, we have a little bit for CIP, but we're not hard piped to the packaging line. And so, you know, we're getting a lot of breakout and foam from the bright tank to the wild goose. And all we had to do was put a heat exchanger right there, right before it goes into a can. So, you know, it comes out of the bright tank at maybe 28 to 30 somehow in that hose gets all way above 30 and then boom, back in the heat exchanger drops it to 30 again into the can. Who knew, <laughs> you know, it's like the easiest stuff in the world that you maybe just don't see because you're so busy running your business and working 60 to 80 hours a week, sometimes a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and that heat exchanger is cheaper than hard piping. Oh, yeah. It, it was like $4,000. Yeah. And next thing you know, um, you know, there's, there's so many things to buy. The CapEx is unlimited. It's goes on forever. We've been sure. trying, trying to build a new restaurant and kitchen right now. We have a food truck like Blaine and the crew are just working on a food truck. It's insane. How many people come to our brewery for beer and food? We had no idea, no idea. Like we tried to do brew pubs around the country and what we should have done the whole time was just invest in our own home. And little did we know, lo and behold, you've been to the brewery. It's beautiful. You're like overlooking the Snake River. It's on the Snake River. We're on six acres surrounded by hundreds of empty acres of BLM land. So people just camp whenever they want. You're looking at beautiful mountains. Ferry Peak is across, right across the way from us. This beautiful, gorgeous, snow-covered peak. Then you can see the Idaho Mountains across the this huge lake called the Palisades. Lo and behold, that is a huge attraction. We have no sign. So you don't, you can't even find us. You try and find us on Google maps. It takes you down this rock quarry. Oh yeah. So you yeah. have to ask someone, how do I get to that white building out on the point surrounded by water? And Shannon and the crew there are kicking ass and taking names. We have become this crazy anomaly in this little town of Alpine where it is packed every single day. So you mentioned this strategy that didn't work out. Um, I've been putting off talking about it, but it seems like at this point of the conversation, we should probably talk about it. Um, you know, as I alluded to at the top of the, of the podcast, you know, it's been both an amazing several years from, for Melvin on the brewing side and also a rather difficult, you know, time on the business side. Obviously you had, you know, some moments in Bellingham, you've had the, the, San Diego brew pub that uh, didn't work out and that you all were forced to close. Um, you had a strategy of this kind of brew pub expansion that, that ultimately you've had to kind of pull back from Eureka in Missouri does seem to be successful so far. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but talk to me a little bit about what that original vision for this kind of hospitality ex of expansion of Melvin looked like the thinking behind it and then how your experiences in these, you know, with this in these various communities, um, has kind of changed your viewpoint on these things. Yeah. I mean, I started tying me up when I was 25 because the restaurant that I was working in, I worked at that restaurant. It went out of business. I asked the landlord, can I start a restaurant here? And had all the equipment, everything. So, Six months of him saying no, he finally said yes. If you can pay the rent in month four, it's yours. So September 1st, 2000, I opened up. And I guess I kind of forgot, like it took me like four or five years to really build the business to where it was successful. 
and timing up is crazy successful. Like it's one thing I did is I don't cater to tourists. We're a tourist town, three and a half million tourists in the summer, 900,000 in the winter. I don't cater to the tourists and my team at time me up, they cater to the locals. Like we have secret things on the menu that are for locals only you, there's a light that hangs from the ceiling. And if you see what the color of that light is, it's the dish is $14 less than what the tourists pay for. Hopefully the tourists don't listen to this, but it's something to give back to my people. You know, like I'm a skid, a ski kid. I grew up in the Simpson house and the rat box, all the houses I lived in in Jackson, in East Jackson that, you know, $200 a month for rent. And now everything is, you know, $2,000 a room. Well, probably like 1500 bucks a room. It is another world now. So we always just thought like, wow, you know, we're really good at running restaurants. Time ups wicked successful for what it is. You know, we have four months of off season, which we like, I wish COVID didn't happen, but luckily for us, COVID did happen during our off season, which is always slow. Like, so it didn't really affect us and on the uh, pub side. Like kind of shoulder between mm-hmm. yeah, high winter season, season and yeah. So every the summer tourists mm-hmm. come for the national Correct. parks and yeah. Like everyone goes on vacation for those two months I have. I mean, I have more vacation time in my life than I'll, I mean, it's been amazing. I've had a great 20 years. Thank you. Time me up. Yeah. And, but yeah, it's, it's what we do every fall and spring. Everyone leaves town for two months. And so we're like, okay, we are good at this. We should do more of this. Cause then we'll be local. Cause we like to call ourselves almost local. Cause when we started sending beer to Boulder, Seattle, Portland, we were accepted as a local brewery. Cause I'm, I lived in, you know, Portland, went to Portland State University. I grew up in Mount Vernon, Washington, north of Seattle. And we were almost local and we got accepted as a local brewery and made great contacts with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people out in those areas. And we thought, wow, we can, we can probably do this anywhere. And so our distributor offered to pay for our brewery up in Western Washington and then down in Southern California also a distributor was willing to help out with that. And we didn't fit in in Bellingham. And then when we got to San Diego, it was just too early. Like we're in this town, this part of town called East village. And I've been going to San Diego for years. Like pizza port is like my church. All right. And I was lucky enough to meet, uh, you know, Vincent or Vinny and or sorry, Vincent Gina. And they've been mentors to me, especially Gina. She's like, like, wow, like, I don't thank you. You're just an amazing person and one of the most successful people in craft brew that you don't even think you are sometimes it's, it, you blow my mind. So just going to San Diego, we're like, we can do this, you know, sure. There's 130 breweries, but we're in East village. East village is like the new up and coming, up and coming. And once we got down there, we got all local investors, just like we did in Washington. It's, you know, 20 local investors for each, each spot. So it's more their place than our place. And, you know, easy village, we were just too, too early, just too early. It's beautiful space, amazing crew. Like the chef, I mean, Tosh was amazing. Bobby, Bobby digital, great brewer. And, uh, our manager was just like off the hook, smart, dedicated, loyal, just wow. So what we didn't realize is the tie me up model took me four years to really get off the ground. And I thought we thought we could just go into East village and crush East village just isn't there yet. It's been a place, um, since the 1930s that has been, uh, you know, an area challenged by homelessness and that stigma for better or worse, for good or bad is still in a lot of people's minds that are in the San Diego area where if you meet someone that's been in San Diego for 30 years, you're like, yeah, come down to East village, check out our spot. They're like, Whoa, I don't go down to East village. Cause they, you know, might've went down there in high school, like 20 years ago, it's changing. Um, but I think we we're just too early and it was just too expensive. And it was, it was tough to give that one up. Um, we closed it a couple months ago. Like the COVID would have definitely put us under if we would have waited, you know, a year. It'd be great because they're building, there's $2.4 billion in investments in that like 20 square block area. And it was eye opening to think as, as a businessman and a dreamer, a visionary and an entrepreneur, that was great that we tried that. 
what if we would have used that money and put it into the Alpine pub? And I think that was a big moment for me where, you know, we have a board of directors and we all voted together, like, let's do San Diego because it looks like a great opportunity. And now looking back, hindsight is 2020, our Alpine facility is off the hook, but yet we're still cooking out of a food kitchen and have river rocks all over instead of a lawn. And Eureka is a place that we are working on and COVID's hit that, you know, really hard. St. Louis got hit really hard and it's a, it's a learning process and it's a great atmosphere, great investment team, all local down there. They're wonderful people and they're fun. And Eli is making some of the bomb ass beer. (laughs) He sends us beer. It's so fun to like drink his beer. Um, Scuba suit. So good. And so right, right now it seems like Eureka is going great, but after COVID, you know, we're just, we're hoping that the world shines so again. What does, what does the next strategy for Melvin look like? Clearly there are some troubles and challenges in this kind of building a, a local investor model and trying to expand in these kind of, you know, um, farther flung locales. Uh, farther from the, that kind of, um, you know, Melvin, Wyoming heartland. Uh, obviously, Melvin has to do that because there are only 600,000 residents of the state of Wyoming, and it is not a particularly great market for the kind of beer that you make. You need to sell beer to customers that are on your wavelength in other markets, and you have to find ways to make it relevant and local-ish for them. Um, how do you do that then going forward from here? So when we started Melvin, we were so, you know, we were like one of the hype breweries. We straight away went into Denver, Seattle, Portland and did really well. Like for, especially for an out of state brewery. In fact, you know, as you can see in Colorado, we're, you know, I think we're, we're doing really good. And one thing we didn't do right away was cover all of Wyoming. Because like you said, it's the least populated state in America. And it's also has the oldest population, not exactly our demographic, but as the craft brew revolution is like reaching all over the world, it's also reaching into Wyoming where we have great breweries. You know, we have snake river that led the way for all of us that makes technical beers that I couldn't even dream of making. Uh, We have black tooth up in Sheridan. They now have a brew pub down in Cheyenne. It is changing and it is become we're, we're a force to be reckoned with you know i was just up in lander um last week with my girlfriend melissa and we were drinking the beers up at uh the lander bar that they make at uh, lander brewing killing it all the breweries are killing it and so what we want to do is work with brews like ten sleep and black tooth and just really get wyoming to pay extra special attention to us and own our own backyard that's something we didn't do because we live in a town of 828 people and a state of a half a million where you look at someone that has a brewery in downtown Portland, you know, they have millions of people and they have a lot more competition, but a lot more people. So what we're doing is we're really preparing. Like we're actually, we've been doing this for months now is owning our own backyard as any brewer would brewery would tell you, like, that's the first thing you should do. Sure. That's, the first thing we didn't do because we just, there wasn't really a backyard yet. Right. And so, uh, we're doing collabs throughout Wyoming and we try to get the Wyoming Brewers Guild. We were doing a collab, but then COVID hit and we also have this amazing bus. I don't know if you've seen it, but we're taking that on trips all over Wyoming and Utah. Pretty sure it's, it's got some craft Uh, beer and brewing stickers on it somewhere. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Yep. And, uh, everyone can, it gets tagged all the time. I love it. And, uh, so, we're taking that bus on trips all over. I mean, I have a new, I'm an RV guy now cause I'm kind of older. It's like this sick little four by four thing that goes anywhere. So me and Melissa go out climbing all over Wyoming. Uh, we're going to get back into snowboarding. turns out when you start a business of this magnitude, you can't snowboard a hundred times a year anymore. But I just hired a new CEO a couple weeks ago to take the day to day headaches away from us, uh, the managers. And he can have those. 
So thanks, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to get back out into the wild and get into Wyoming and go see Lander, go see Sheridan, go see Thermopolis, like all these cool, amazing towns that maybe they only have 400 people, but we're going to, we're going to let them know we have beer for them. We coming out with a beer called star Valley. It's a IPA because we're in star Valley. Right. Alpine yep. is in star Valley. And it's a beer for Wyoming. It's our beer people. And it's a, uh, it's fun, fun being from Wyoming. Cause you look at some of the things that a city has and you know, they have a population, they have great shipping, great talent pool to hire from. Wyoming has the outdoors. It is insane. People, if you've never been to Western Wyoming, like you don't have to turn this podcast off. You can keep listening to it, get in your car and go. It you can is listen to insane. this episode and about four others <laughs> or five others. Maybe in the 20. Time, maybe 20. Yeah. And the time that'll take you to drive. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, owning our own backyard, which, For sure. which For we sure. love to do because we're from Wyoming. We are Wyoming. And right, together with right. all, all the other brewers, like we want to, we want people to know. So there's this growing up process that we've watched Melvin go through over the last number of years. And, you know, the early days of Melvin were hardcore party. Obviously, you come out of uh, action sports um, and outdoors entertainment exploits. You know, you, you have this kind of restaurant. You have this brewery. You make crazy beers. You build this brand that is... Um, about the party and about the fun, but you're... I wouldn't say the party was just about having fun, like making beer fun again. Cause it got, sure. it seemed to be so serious when we started. Like yeah. everyone was so serious, like sniffing and tasting and it's like, have a beer, enjoy it. Yeah. Um, yes, <laughs> that, that's, that's certainly a component like, and a like part of craft beer. We're an events yeah. company that seems to make really good beer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you've you're getting older the business is getting older you're discovering that the beer the quality of the beer also attracts other types of customers um and you've also found that sometimes that kind of fun loose party approach can be a liability for the overall business um do you have any regrets and then how have you been working to change that narrative and help people understand what you think Melvin is really about. I think a lot of it comes from, you know, being from Wyoming, being on a three rail system at that time we were like, Hey, notice us. Don't forget about us. What about us? Cause we didn't have a platform. We made great beer that nobody could have. We didn't have a backyard. We, I mean, people in Jackson didn't even like our beer for the first couple of years. They're like, what's wrong with your beer? And, you know, and that, that, that didn't feel great. But once again, it's just beer. And so we took that attitude out, like having, you know, very inclusive, great fun at all of our events with everyone that was included was part of a good time. Like no one on the Melbourne team is allowed to just go to uh, an event at a bar and just sit there and and drink beer. Like, you know, a lot of the beer companies do their reps just sit there and drink beer at a table. Like we want to interact. We want to know these people. We want to get to know them and we want them to know us because then once you meet someone from Melvin, you're like, wow, these, these men and women are pretty, pretty solid people. And a big thing about what I've kind of gone through in the last couple of years is my girlfriend, Melissa has really helped me uh, get grounded and see the big picture. And as we create a life together, you know, we get to see what's, what are we looking for in five years instead of what are we looking for next week? Everything is slowed down. And now that we know that we're a mature, successful business, we're planning out months, if not years ahead. And, you know, she worked at Crooked Stave. She, for years, she ran their warehouse. Um, she worked at Prost, Denver beer company, I think. Hi, Charlie. And she's really helped slow me down and, and smarten me up. It's been an amazing process and so fun. And I love her for that. So I think that's, you know, when you look at the top down, then the leadership comes from the top. I think me slowing down and yeah, I have been on the road for five years. 
been thanks to Melvin and people that like craft beer. I've been all over the world, like Europe, China, Japan, Korea, just many states, many great times with all these beautiful people out there. But I think slowing that down, and especially these last six months, I've been on one airplane in 2020. And you know what? I used to love, I used to get antsy being in one place for too long. Now it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice discovering Alpine, Wyoming and the people that, uh, that live there. Typically when we close the podcast, we ask a question that's consistent for all the guests. Uh, and that's a question I think is important for all of us, you know, that are working within the craft beer industry and, and business. Um, that question is what does success look like? for you. So from a Melvin standpoint, from a personal standpoint, for you and and for the business as a whole, what does success look like? When will you know that you've achieved it? And how do you define it? And how are you, do you strive towards that goal? I think a big part of success is part of me is I've already, I've followed my dream. Like I set out to do this when I was 16 years old. And I've done it. And now, do I want to keep doing it? Do I want to keep doing this for 10 more years? Not totally sure. Do I love what I'm doing? Yes. I think the biggest thing I love is the team. All the people that work at Melvin have become like my friends and my best friends. So I think success would be when we can all comfortably know that we can buy houses. We can give back to the community. We can be part of something that's bigger than craft beer. And that's something we're working on right now and have been working on for the last couple of years. And I think these next two years are really going to define a lot of businesses in America and just being on the right side of history and going forward in a positive direction where you know it's not going to be easy. But yeah, let's keep it fun. End of the day, knowing we have to make money to survive. And Melvin's been really bad at making money. And so... (laughs) losing money since 2015 we like to say but we have you know we knew like our projections we knew this was going to be like this for five six seven years and we're going to come out on the other side where everyone is healthy and hopefully we all become wealthy i think for us i think we're about what twenty four thousand barrels last year and you know our product portfolio is one of them if you go to a grocery store our beer is usually the most expensive and it's for a reason. It's, it's really good. And it comes from the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. And we, you know, we pay, I feel great wages. So once we are able to break, I think it's about that 32,000, 34,000 mark. That's our break even. And we were on track for 32,000 before COVID. Very exciting time. Like January, February. We're yeah. like, oh yeah. my, it's going to happen. And then COVID but we're on the same boat on this one together people. So it's like, we're going to make it through. And I think just getting to a nice point of where, you know, one of my mentors is Bjorn up at big sky. And he's been telling me since day one, like he's been with me since I had time me up, like coaching me and, and showing me the way he's like 3% growth, man. That's what you want. And now I get it like 3% growth. You know, I think we grew like hundred and something percent the first year, crazy number the second year. But that stability in the structure, once we rediscover that structure and implement more of a structure that we kind of didn't have because we grew so fast, I think that's when we'll feel successful, when we can execute on our strategic plan and be happy. But right now we're all having fun. So that helps a lot. Does that, does that answer your question, Jamie? I think that answers my question, Jeremy. Nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. Old Orchard supplies juice blends from Beer City, USA. Hopsteiner is your premium supplier for quality hops and hops products. Scott Fabricating invites you to take a ride on the Magic Bus. Historical Brewing Techniques, the lost art of farmhouse brewing, is out now from Brewers Publications. And Craft Beer and Brewing's all-access subscriptions are the best way to support this very podcast. If people want to find Melvin where do they find you, Jeremy? I believe we have the Instagrams and perhaps some Twitter and there might even be some Facebook out there. Haven't checked it recently, but if you do want to see us on the Melbourne happening hour, 
check us out with Ashley Carter next week. Ashley every Wednesday Carter night of Beer Stout Lager House, a fantastic brewer and a wonderful person, and also a previous guest on this podcast. And mm-hmm. then also Dick Cantwell and Peter Buchart, June seventeenth, seven p.m. <laughs> Wednesday. Win your autographed copies. We actually forged them, so it's. I don't, know, I don't think it really matters. Um, question: Has Joe from Pint House ever been a guest? Joe Morfeld has absolutely been a guest. I think it was episode fifty of the podcast will, that Joe was on. Will you? tweet who got the most listens because me and that guy between you and joe oh yeah he's have you seen the alpha king video where he's like he's like watch the alpha king video where pine house wins he's holding the paddle the winning paddle for winning alpha king and he's like hey jeremy bet you wish you had one of these and so now it's become like a sticker war (laughs) and like a text thread that goes back years with tyler brown and ben edmonds and me just making fun of each other and that is so much the camaraderie of beer is just kind of just picking on each other for sure. For sure. Well, here's the funny story about that is, uh, that was the year that, uh, um, Oh, we, we, you know, we obviously was in Denver. Um, but I did that podcast with Joe episode 50 on a Thursday on Friday. He won alpha King mm-hmm. and Friday was the day that we posted that episode of the podcast the day that he won Alpha King, even though we recorded the episode the day before. And so that's how on trend we were Trending. with, you know, um, that we, that that's the foresight that goes into the craft oh, yeah. brewing podcast here. And so I, you know, of course texted him on that. I'm, I'm looking at the numbers right here and, and Joe's episode, uh, has, seen 20,681 downloads. That is a high bar for you to, uh, to cross Jeremy. Mm-hmm. I, I don't mm-hmm. know that you're going to do it, but we can try, uh, um, you know, but yes, you can try. Just need some to um, rib him a little bit. Uh, so far he's got you on that one, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, it's kind of in your court as to, to how well you push this out there, regardless of this inside podcast, baseball, Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Jeremy. man. Really it's, good to see you again. It's uh, always good to, to see you hang out, drink some beer. Uh, you know, again, it's been a weird and difficult, uh, you know, few years, but also a really amazing few years from Melvin. Um, and I'm glad you could come talk to us on the podcast about it. Thanks. And I'd like to thank everyone that drinks our beer and everyone that supports us and everyone that works at Melvin. Like it's been an amazing ride and I can't wait to keep on doing it. Thanks. Kisses. Yeah. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.